Well, good morning. You know, any time that we endeavor to do anything, especially anything that requires effort or, or long, a long duration to accomplish, we need something to keep us going. What is it that we need to keep us going? Coffee, all right, I agree. But what, what is it that you need when, when you say, in order to accomplish something hard, in order to, to put the hard work in, what is it that you need? Motivation. Did someone say motivation? Yes. All right. We need motivation, right? Anything that we do that's, that's difficult or challenging, right, requires motivation. And today, as we continue our journey uh, of thinking about a fresh start, not only a fresh start, but a strong start, and not only a strong start, but something that would continue. I want us to think about our motivation, right? Because we all need motivation. And as, as followers of Jesus, right, if you are, are saved, if you've been born again, if you've come by faith and experienced the grace of God and you've been born again, you have the privilege of being called a child of God. A child of God. Now, that's such a familiar, familiar phrase, child of God. It's, we've all heard it, but it, it's something that, that we need to realize the magnitude of, the importance of, the amazement that we should have, that we get the privilege or the right to be called God's children. One of the time when my, when my children were little, we were talking about love, and, and I said, the reason that I love you, right? The reason that I love you is not what you do, right? It's not whether you behave or don't behave, right? The reason I love my children is because they are mine. They're mine. And nothing, nothing they do could stop me from loving them. In 1 John chapter 3, we're going to be in Ephesians 5, so don't, don't turn to 1 John. You can turn to Ephesians 5. But in 1 John... Chapter 3, verse 1, John says, Look or behold at how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. He says, The Father has lavished a great love on us that we would have the privilege to be called God's children. And he says, We are loved by the Father. God loves you. We, we, we looked at that on Monday, right, as we put our name in John 3, 16, that as we considered that God demonstrated his love towards us, right, that we had earned the wage of death through our sin, but the gift of God is eternal life, and God offers that to us. You know, when I was a camper here a long, long time ago, right, I had the privilege of meeting and knowing Gladys Chahi, one of the founders of this camp. And there are two things that I always distinctly will remember about her. The first is her playing the cowbells. And I wish that you would have had the privilege that I had to see her and to hear her play the cowbells. It was an amazing, an amazing sight. And, and, and that, that I can still see her in Chatlow's Chapel with all the cowbells. And she'd have sometimes like 15 or 20 in her hand. I don't know how she did it. But it, it was an amazing thing. But the other thing that I will always remember about Gladys J. is that Her life verse, her favorite verse, was Galatians 2.20. And I can still see her, and I don't know what the setting was, but she was standing out in the the foyer uh, outside of Chatlos, and I remember hearing her quote Galatians 2.20. For I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that... That verse, part of Paul's testimony, stuck with me. And for Paul, he found such deep motivation to follow Christ, to live for Christ, right? to to give his life, to point others to the gospel, and to disciple and to serve Jesus with his life. He found such great motivation in what Jesus had done for him. He says, I, I was crucified with Christ. My, my old life, my sinful life, it was crucified with Christ. He says, but I still live. 
But not, it's not me anymore. It's not about me anymore. He says, now, now it's Christ living in me. And he says, I, I now live by faith. And I trust God and I follow God. But notice his motivation. He says, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul found incredible motivation in the deep love of God. That he knew that he did not deserve. That he did not earn. But God lavished on him freely. And so as we think about what it takes to have a fresh start, what it takes to continue strong, we've talked about obedience, and we've talked about wisdom, and today we're going to talk about love. And as we think about love, we, we have to kind of step back and ask ourselves in that question, what is love? Well, John defined love in his letter in 1 John. He said, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is one of the defining characteristics of God. And not only is it a defining characteristic of God, Jesus made it explicitly clear that love was to be a defining characteristic of his followers. He said this in John 13, 35. Just write down the reference because we're going to jump into Ephesians here in a moment. But Jesus said this the night before the cross. He said, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Right, that loving each other is supposed to be the defining characteristic of, of Christians, that people ought to look at us and say, man, I don't agree with everything Christians believe. They believe some weird stuff. I, I, don't, I don't get it all, but you know what? They do love each other. No one loves each other like Christians. No one cares about each other. No one serves each other. No one looks out for each other like the body of Christ. That's what it ought to look like. And so I want us to consider the subject of love. There's a, a, a dozens of texts that we could look at, but Ephesians chapter 5 Verses 1 and 2 is where I want us to spend our time this morning. And so let's look at it together. Ephesians 5, just the first two verses. Paul says, Therefore, be imitators of God. Now, let's just pause there for a moment. Be imitators of God. How many of you have experienced something in life that felt really intimidating and overwhelming and probably impossible? All right. All of us can identify with the situation. Maybe it was a piece of music that got put in front of you, and you looked at it and thought, what? I don't think I can do this. This is too hard. This is too difficult. Well, Paul says, be imitators of God. And we have to step back and say, how am I supposed to imitate God? But notice what he says. He says, do this as dearly loved children. And walk in love, as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us as a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. And so Paul says that we're to imitate God. As his children, we're to imitate him. And to imitate means to mimic or to pattern our lives after. Now, we know that children imitate. right? One of the scariest things as a parent, is when you see your children imitating you. When you hear them imitating you. When they say things and you think, that's what I say. Or they do things and you're like, that's what I do. See, we are wired to imitate. We learn by observing and listening and then repeating those actions and words. And so children, without being prompted, without being told to, imitate. They mimic what they see and they hear. And so you were born an imitator. And imitation doesn't stop just when we're little kids, does it? We all are imitators. We see, we hear, and we imitate. And so Paul says, as dearly loved children, we are to be imitators of God. But again, that seems really abstract, doesn't it? Okay, it's one thing to imitate something that I can see. It's one thing that I can, I, I can imitate something that I hear. But how do I imitate God? Well, notice what Paul says. He says that we are to walk in love as the Messiah has also loved us. And so Paul says we imitate God by walking or living in love. Right? And God, we've already said John 
already reminded us that God is love. And so how do we do this? Well, Jesus came to earth, right? You know that. God inhabited a human body. And he did that, obviously, ultimately, his ultimate purpose was so that he could be a sacrifice for our sins, that he could take our place, your place, my place, and bear the curse and the consequence of sin in order that we might be forgiven, restored, redeemed, that we might be saved, that we might belong to him, that we might be rescued from the curse and consequence of sin, which is death, and we might be given life, eternal life, that we might know him and worship him and glorify him forever and ever. But Jesus didn't just swoop down and come into the world, die on the cross, pay for our sins, rise from the dead and conquer the death and the grave and go back to heaven. He spent time here. He lived here. And part of his purpose was so that he would show us what God was like, he was God, and to show us how to live. And so Jesus is our example of what love looks like. And throughout his life, Jesus consistently demonstrated what love looked like. And so as Paul is writing this this letter to the church at Ephesus, as he says, be imitators of God, mimic God. And he says, as dearly loved children, right? He says, you are loved by God. You are loved by your heavenly father, right? He absolutely loves you. And he loves you because you're his, right? If you are saved, if you're a child of God, you belong to him and God loves you because you're his. And he doesn't just love you on your good days. He doesn't just love you when you obey. He doesn't love you part of the time. He loves you all the time. He never, ever, ever stops loving you. And listen, when God saved you, he knew everything about you. He knew everything about your past. He knew everything about your present. And he knew everything about your future. He knew every time that you would disappoint him. He knew every time that you would fail him. He knew every time that you'd fall short. And it did not stop him from choosing you. And it did not stop him from loving you. And it does not stop him from loving you. And if we're going to be imitators of God, and if we're going to live lives of love, it has to begin. It has to start with knowing and deeply experiencing the truth and the reality that God loves me. The one who is love, right? God is love. The one who is love loves me. And he loves me not because I deserve it, not because I earn it, not because there's anything in me that was worthy of that, but simply because he chooses to love me. And he demonstrates his love through Christ. And not only, of course, the greatest demonstration of his love is the cross, but as I think about his life, as I think about his teaching, I think about all the times that Jesus demonstrated love. I think about John chapter 4, when he says, I have to go through Samaria, a place that Jews did not travel because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Right? They, were, they were somewhat related, but not really. They worshipped differently, and they hated each other. And Jesus says I, Jews would travel way out of their way just to avoid going through Samaria. And he goes to Samaria, and he's waiting by a well, and the disciples went into town to get some McDonald's. And Just kidding. And, and Jesus is alone, and this woman comes out, and she, you know, we don't know her whole story, but... We know that her life was, was not an easy life. She'd been married five times, and now she's with a guy that she's not legally married to, and that's a complex thing in that world. She comes alone instead of with the other women, and so we know that whatever her story is, it's been a difficult story, a painful story, and Jesus intersects her life, and he asks her question, and asks her to give him a drink, and, and ultimately he uses that encounter to reveal himself as the Messiah to her and to change her life forever. In John chapter 8, there was a woman who was drugged into the temple one day when Jesus was teaching, right? Jesus is like having a church service, right, in the courtyard of the temple, and these men drag this woman into the service, right, in the middle of the whole thing, and they say, we caught her in adultery, and the law says that we should stone her, and they've got rocks in their hands, and they say, what do we need to do, Jesus? And of course, we know that he stoops down, and he draws in the dirt, and then he finally says, hey, whoever's without sin can cast the first stone. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they drop their rocks and they walk out. And Jesus says, where are your accusers? She says, there's none. He says, neither do I accuse you or condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus demonstrated love over and over again. In Luke chapter 7, 
There was a time where Jesus was having dinner at a man named Simon's house, and, and, and this woman, who was probably a prostitute, heard that Jesus was there. She had heard about Jesus' teaching. She had heard about his message. And she came, and she comes into the dinner, and she starts, she starts washing and anointing Jesus' feet. And everyone there is looking at her, staring at her, staring at Jesus. And he defends her and stands up for her and proclaims that her sins are forgiven because she has come to him in faith. So over and over again, Jesus demonstrates love. We talked about this on Monday, but the night before the, of the cross, Jesus, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And among those feet that he washed, and can you imagine the disciples' feet for a minute? Right, these guys, right? I mean, how many of you like, are bothered? Anybody bothered by feet? Anybody? All right. Yeah. I mean, the disciples' feet were not the, probably the nicest of feet, right? I mean, these are fishermen. These are blue-collar guys. These are guys that wear sandals and walk in the dirt, right? I mean, I mean feet, feet are not the most pleasant things. But beyond the physical realities, Jesus even washed Judas' feet the one who is about to betray him. And so over and over again, Jesus demonstrates what love looks like. And after he got done washing his disciples' feet, he said this, a new commandment I give to you, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, as I've loved you, The way that I, and you have seen me love. You've seen me love others. You've seen me love you. As I have loved you, you are to love one another. And Jesus would then show them the ultimate demonstration of love as he willingly submits himself to the injustice and the evil of what was done to him. As he is betrayed by Judas, one of his own followers. As he is arrested at night as he is put on trial illegally, as he is mocked and tortured and beaten and nailed to a cross. He demonstrates for them what love looks like, even as he looks out at his executioners and says, Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Apostle John was an eyewitness to all of this. Right? He's one of Jesus' closest followers, one of the 12 disciples. He watched Jesus live He watched Jesus love. He had his feet washed by Jesus. He watched Jesus die, and he saw Jesus risen from the dead. He saw him ascend back to the Father. And John, who experienced all of that, said this, 1 John 4, verse 10. He said, this is love. He says, let me tell you what love is. Because I, I had a front row seat to love. The God who is love showed up in the world. And I was there. And for whatever reason, he came by and he called me and my brother to leave our fishing business and to be his followers, to be his disciples. And he says, let me tell you, this is what love is. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In order to live a life of love, which you have been called to live, you first have to know and experience God's love for you. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 again, verse 2. Paul says, walk in love. Live a life of love just as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Notice the key word there. It says the Messiah loved us and what? He gave himself for us. You see, that's the key to living a life of love. The key to living a life of love is giving. Because ultimately love is giving of what is valuable to us, to others. What's one of the most valuable things that you have? Your most valuable resource. Are you aware of it? It's time. And when you're young, you might think that you have a lot of it. But the older you get the more you realize that you have less and less. Love is giving of time. It's giving of resources, of our abilities, of our attention, of our very lives. It's putting others ahead of ourselves. And God has called you to live a life not focused on yourself, 
God hasn't called you to live for yourself. The world will tell you to live for you, to live for yourself, for your pleasure, for your desires, for your wants, for your dreams, for your ambitions. But God calls you to live a different way. And if you want to have a fresh start, and you want to have a strong start, and you want to live a life that's meaningful and purposeful, and God created you on purpose, and God created you for a purpose, and if you want to engage in that purpose, you haven't been called to live a life for yourself. And living a life for yourself might seem good at first, but I've watched others walk down that road, and that road does not lead to where you think it will. It leads to self-absorption. It leads, it leads ultimately to dissatisfaction, discontentment. It's empty because you weren't made to live for yourself. You were made to live for God and to live for others. Remember what, what Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It's not me anymore, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are called to be imitators of Jesus' life, to lay down our lives in love. Now, it's easy, I think, sometimes to think, well, I need to do this in a big, dramatic way. Right? And, and sometimes doing things in a big, dramatic way is actually easier than doing it little by little. But most often, God will call you to lay down your life little by little, one moment at a time, one choice at a time, one act of kindness, one giving up of something that's valuable to you to serve someone else. And God calls you and I to live lives of love. And G Paul says that, that doing so will be a pleasing sacrifice. Look, look back at Ephesians 5.2. It says it will be a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Right? Paul's drawing from the Old Testament where there was a grain offering that was flour mixed with oil and frankincense, and it was offered as, a, as an offering to God. He says it's a pleasing smell. It's a pleasing sacrifice to the Father. And it's a reminder that love does require sacrifice. Love requires giving up. It will cost you to love people. It will cost you something when you love the way Jesus loved. For Jesus to love you, it cost him his very life. Love always has a cost, but I want you to know something. It's worth the cost. It is absolutely worth the cost. We have been called to be imitators of Jesus' life, to live lives that genuinely reflect God's love to our world. And listen, our world is craving genuine love. Craving it. And it's so confused about what love actually is and what love actually looks like. And love isn't just being affirmed in all of your notions or your feelings or your wants, or your desires. God is love, right? Jesus came full of, from the Father, full of grace and truth. And our world needs to see what real love looks like, what genuine love looks like. And Jesus was the embodiment of that love, and as his followers, he calls us to do the same. Right, Jesus walked everywhere he went. That was the average mode of transportation in his day. But he could have arranged for a chariot to take him around. He showed mercy and kindness to the undeserving over and over again. You know, the time that you need love the most is when you deserve it the least. And I hope that sometime in your life, when you were undeserving of love, someone showed you love anyway. Because that's a reflection of God's love. The time that you need love and the time that people in your life, the people that you're to love, need love the most is when they deserve it the least. And Jesus modeled that. He served others instead of demanding to be served. Right? Jesus had every right to walk into the Last Supper and say, guys, what are you doing? Nobody's washed feet. Listen, washing feet was a custom. It was to be done. They reclined around a table when they ate, which meant your feet ended up near somebody's what? Face, right? Now do you understand why foot washing was important? And somebody should have looked at that towel in the basin in the corner and said, I'll do it. But nobody did. And Jesus could have had every right to say, guys, one of you, yo, John, get over there and get the towel and the basin and wash our feet. Could have done that. He'd have had every right to do that. But instead, he went over, tied the towel around his waist, and washed his disciples' feet. He served instead of demanding to be served. He spoke truth. He rebuked those who needed warning. Sometimes love comes in the form of a rebuke. 
He taught that greatness comes not from grabbing power, but by being a servant and laying our life down for others. And so Paul calls us to be imitators of God. And when we become imitators of Jesus, we'll live lives that look upside down to this world. Because the world says to live for yourself, to live for your own glory, to live for your own desires. But a life focused on self and not on God is an empty life. It's a meaningless life. And I don't want to see any of you go down that path. So real quickly this morning, I want to give you three, three things, three takeaways that are important. If you're going to have a fresh start and live this life of love, live a life of, of imitating Jesus, number one, you need to embrace your identity as God's child. To embrace your identity. Uh, we live in a world where people are searching and craving and trying to understand the subject of identity. But here's the thing. Your identity is found, first of all, in the fact that you were made as a human being in the image of God. You're an image bearer of the very God of the universe. And if you're, if you're born again, if you're saved, if you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a child of God and you need to embrace your identity. This is who I am. I am a child of God. I am deeply and dearly loved. I am forgiven and accepted. I'm an heir of his kingdom. I'm a citizen of his kingdom, and I'm an ambassador of that kingdom, and I have a purpose, and I need to embrace, I need to know who I am and embrace my identity as his child. Number two, I need to experience God's love frequently. To experience his love frequently. It's not just enough to know intellectually that God loves me. I need to experience his love. God really loves me. He demonstrated his love. And so how do I do that? It's the simple basic things, but the things that we sometimes neglect. To spend time in his word, reading. And not just reading word or not, not just reading the Bible for information or to learn, but saying, God, I want to hear you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you. I want to seek him in prayer, in worship. You know, how many of you love sing time? All right. Good. You all got the question correct. But you know, one of the reasons I think we all love sing time is it's it's such a powerful time because it's a time where heaven and earth touch. Where we, where we worship God together, where we're reminded through the truth of song or the power of a testimony of, of who God is, right? And we're reminded of His love for us. We need those reminders. We need to be in fellowship with other believers. Sometimes you just need someone else in your life to model God's love for you because for whatever reason you've forgotten or lost sight of it. Or sometimes you just need someone to tell you, hey, God loves you. The circumstances of life or the things that are swirling in your mind have made it hard for you to remember that. You need to experience God's love frequently. And number three, engage in loving people with God's love. Right? Engage. To to put it in gear, right? And and there's a world filled with people that need to be loved. And so start with those closest to you. Your family. And and I know family things can be really complicated sometimes. And, And loving our family is a complicated thing. But start with your family. You have neighbors. You have a church family. You have a community. You have classmates. People that you encounter. Right? Love isn't just a sentiment, it's not just a feeling, it's not just an emotion, it's action, it's doing. And so love shares, love serves, love shapes lives. And so engage in loving people. If you want to have a fresh start, God's called you to live this way. One of the things that God convicted me of when I was a, a student here was that yes, I loved God and I was saved and, and I knew that, but I wasn't really actively loving people the way I was treating them the way I was speaking to them, my actions, my words were not always communicating who I was, but they weren't communicating God's love. And God began to convict me. Did I live that out perfectly? No. But I can tell you there was a dramatic change between my junior and senior years of high school because of what God did in my life here. And what God did for me, I want him to do for you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We're grateful for your mercies that are new today. Father, I thank you that you're the God of fresh starts and new beginnings. And Father, I thank you that you can give anyone a new beginning and that you delight in doing so, that it's your joy to do so. And Father, I pray that we would understand how much you love us. Father, I pray that we would experience your love and then we would live lives of sharing that love with our world. Father, we are all imitators. So, Father, I pray that we would be choose to be imitators of Jesus. And we would do that by your grace, through the power of your spirit. Give us strength for today. Help us to love one another today. Give us opportunities, even here today, to show and demonstrate your love to one another. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.